Welcome to my workshop and a look at two of Hornby's latest locomotives. Locomotives which I helped in the development of. The Thompson A22, Cock of the North, and the Thompson A23, Steady Aim. What I'm going to be doing is just detailing, improving slightly, renumbering, renaming, weathering and so on. Simple things that anyone can do. But first, check your reference material. The Green Bible, the RCTS Part 2A. Another useful one, the power of the A2s. And finally, Probably the most comprehensive, the Irwell book on the A1 and A2 Pacifics. This sort of material will give you chapter on verse, chapter and verse, should I say, on what's required, how to make these models as accurate as possible. They are certainly accurate at source. These are just a few simple improvements. The A22, this version, is supplied as Cock of the North. Now the nameplates, although accurate and the right size, are really only printed. So the simplest thing to make this more accurate, better looking, is to attach etched plates. Etched plates from the likes of 247 development. These are just cut from the fret and ready to be stuck on. OK, how to stick the nameplates on. Evo stick. It's not the glue it was because fools used to sniff it. But it's perfectly OK for this. Used in impact mode, that is to smear small amounts on both components. It is a bit stringy, so be careful. Just small amounts, that'll do. And then on the Hornby nameplate. Don't get any beyond the boundaries. Now this very cleverly, what Hornby has done is provide the backing piece, the backing piece which the actual locomotives had, which ensured that the nameplate was fully horizontal. After about three or four minutes, the Evo stick, which was applied by the way on the end of a scrap piece of wire, will have dried enough to use in impact mode. So here we go. And just stick it on. Make sure it's level, for fully parallel with the ejector pipe and the handrails. Make sure it's pressed down firmly with a cocktail stick. The cocktail stick is soft enough not to damage the background paintwork and that just gives some relief to the nameplate. Just more realistic really and very simple. Now it's exactly the same procedure fixing nameplates for the A23. However in this case we're changing steady aim to Honeyway. So just make sure that that goes on neatly, not too much. And the same with the nameplate itself. Don't worry too much if a little sort of blob goes slightly out. That can be picked back later. Let that dry 
for a few minutes. Once secure, Evo stick has dried and you put the plate on with the adhesive in impact mode and just make sure that it's firmly in place with a cocktail stick. Far superior. And exactly the same procedure can be used to fix the replacement front number plate on. You'll note that I had a tiny bit too much glue on the end of the piece of wire and that just caught on the cross rail. It was easily picked off by the end of the cocktail stick once the glue had dried. The replacement front number plate is in place. The difference of course with 60501 is that 60512 needs altering to 60519. Now rather than replace every single digit what I do is just take off, well in this case, the last one. And I use a brand new blade in a Swan Morton knife. Very, very carefully. A very slight mark is left. As long as you're careful, it won't damage the finish. And when the replacement digit is on and the loco is weathered, you won't be able to tell. Once you're happy with the position or pretty near the backing paper or the, the covering paper, should I say, can then just be eased off. The replacement digits are press fix number 14, BR, loco, lettering, numbering and so on. Now once the replacement number has been stuck down, pressed down with a cotton handkerchief, the final job is just a little lick of Humbro decal fix, or decal fix I think the Americans say. Just a little lick. Press that down once it's done and it'll dry and then you can clean it off with ordinary plain water. I'm not worried if the numbers don't match exactly in colour and tone because this, is going, this loco is going to be weathered slightly and then it will disappear. But I think you'll see it looks okay. Other items worth replacing are etched brass works plates. Again, in this case, from 247 Developments. And they're fixed on differently from the name plates in that I use glue and glaze. All one does is get a tiny little bead of the deluxe glue and glaze on top of the original printed works plate and then slide the replacement on. These will fight you every inch of the way. It's all part of it. They're also dead easy to get on upside down. I think I've got that right. There we are, and that little bit can be picked off afterwards. One other thing to note is the replacement shed plate, this time from Model Masters, a water slide transfer. 60519 Honeyway was shedded at 64B Haymarket. And you can see the replacement in place. One thing that is a slight disappointment is the provision of the front coupling. In fact, the lack of provision of a front coupling. It really is, well it's there, it's a hook, but Hornby doesn't supply a shackle. So grip that in a pair of snipe nose pliers and pull. And out it comes. I can't recall who actually makes this replacement. It might be Hornby themselves, or maybe even Backman. Anyway, it's far better and it's just held in place in the original slot with a little bead 
of superglue. One or two things are expected to be fitted by the purchaser, including front steps. Now, I understand why these are left off, because if this loco is required to go round train set curves, the bogey wheels will foul. What I've done is to apply a small amount of super glue to the end of the step and it fits very conveniently into a slot that's provided. Now it's not a tight fit and it will wobble around to start with so you have to jockey it into position and make sure that it stays in position. The steps are handed so make sure you get them the right way round. And once the initial glue has set, just run a further bead alongside the front edge of the steps where they meet the buffer beam. Not much because you don't want to block up the sprung buffers. Other things to fit are the cylinder drain cocks. And they fit snugly into their holes in the bottoms of the cylinders, but they need just a little bead of super glue plied on the end of a piece of scrap wire and capillary action will draw that in. You'll note on all these procedures, well certainly the procedures on the A22, that I've separated the body from the frames and that I'm holding the components or the components are being held for me in a little foam cradle which is a a Pico product. Very, very useful. Don't try doing all these detailing things with the loco body attached to the frames. Okay, just of its nameplates, but stuff like this, you're liable to damage something. One final job to fit on the chassis are the brake rods, the brake rigging. And I admit I find this a bit of a fiddle. You've got to sort of push and shove. They're held in place by friction. You need really good eyes and hope that the little pins go in. They're now in place. The main problem, of course, with this procedure is hands get in the way of the camera and it's constantly having to be turned. So you'll have to take my word for it that I have managed to fix these in. Um, it's a bit of a tight fit at the front there, if you look, but worth doing. My name's Jeff Haynes, and uh, I do quite a bit of painting and lining. Today we're going to start off with a bit of weathering, and we're also going to do some varnishing. I'm going to start off by mixing a my, what I call my standard wash-over weathering mix. Uh, I've got some matte black and some Revel 84, which is a sort of a medium brown. I'm going to mix it up in, in the proportion of two parts of matte black and one part uh, brown. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to give the tins a little bit of a stir. I just happen to be starting a new tin uh, on the matte black side. I use a variety of different makes of paint. I just happen to quite like some of the Revel colours and uh, I've not yet had a tin of Revel black dry up on me. Okay, that's just to get rid of the thick bit out of the bottom. I'm using some homemade paint stirrers made out of some copper rod. So, the weathering mix, I'm going to use two parts of matte black, one, two, okay, and this measuring spoon is made in the same way as the homemade paint stirrer, <clears throat> but it's an ideal size for measuring out small quantities of paint, and some brown. Okay, the brown tends to go a long way. Uh, 
Okay, so that's the two colours mixed in together. Okay, I want it to have uh, a black look with a hint of brown. Now let's put some thinners in there. I put three scoops of paint in there, so I'm going to put three generous scoops of white spirit in there, and then maybe just a little bit more as well. <clears throat> okay, a dirty black. We're about to start weathering the A22. I've put the paint into the uh, cup. I'm using an, uh, an Aguata TR2 airbrush for today. Uh, because it's nice and controllable, I can uh, have a very uh, small amount of paint going on for getting into the corners, uh, or I can put larger amounts in from a greater distance. <clears throat> Protection-wise, I'd normally be wearing a mask at this particular point. Uh, I always use a glove to hold the loco, because uh, I don't really want to have to keep scrubbing the paint off. Uh, and uh, I'm about to put the extractor fan on to take away the, the paint fumes. Okay, I'm just testing the flow of the airbrush just to make sure that the paint's coming out nice and cleanly uh, and there's no blockages. Now we're ready to go. Now I'm actually going to start with the tender because it's a nice flat surface to try and get the, uh, to, to set what the tone of the weathering is going to look like and then it's easier then to match that on the loco I find. Just a personal thing. I'm going to start with the back. Okay, I've just wafted some over there. You notice I'm moving the model around to make sure I'm getting into all of the corners, uh, but keeping the distance back with the airbrush because I don't want a lot of build up in there. Let's turn to the side. Already you can notice the difference that the toning has taken on the tender compared to the loco. What I'm going to do now is set the tender aside so we can focus a bit more on the loco, but I may want to return to the tender to put a, perhaps put a little bit more brown in the mix just for the underframe to reflect the, uh, the dirt uh, bouncing up from the track. But let's turn to the loco. This is a little something I like to do with buffer beams, particularly on slightly dirtier locos. Uh, it, can be, it can be for cleaner locos as well, but just to break this up a little bit, uh, I've got a bit of white spirit there. So I've just dipped a brush in there. I'm just brushing the, th uh, the weathered paint away. And it tends to collect in the corners uh, and perhaps around the rivets. I'm going to leave that to dry just for a few minutes and then I'm going to put another wash of weathering over it. Okay, so what I've done here, I've put on another small thin layer of thinner onto the buffer beam and brushed it again with the thinners and we're starting to get that more random look that you see in so many colour photos of late, uh, locos in their later life. So, I've been going around with the airbrush getting into some of the, uh, getting a little tighter into some of the areas uh, and putting a bit more weathering on here and there. And I've put a little bit more than I wanted to onto the nameplate. So I'm going to just take that back. I've got my brush with just a little bit of thinners on there. I'm just going to 
brush across the name plates there. I'll let that let the white spirit dry, and then just tone it down gently again uh, in a couple of minutes. Now the weathering is done, uh, or the airbrushing is done, what I'm going to do is just clean the windows ever so slightly. I'm going to use the same technique as, of, as you've seen before, except this time I'm going to dry the brush ever so slightly on some kitchen towel. I just want to put a bit of white spirit on there. There was just a little bit too much weathering on the windows. You can't help it and, uh, unless you're going to mask it. But it's just a lot easier just to clean them with a bit of white spirit afterwards. And there we go. And if anything, that will actually help the, the, uh, the weathered colour to collect in the corners. Okay, the weathering's had a good time to dry now. Uh, and I'm just going to vary things ever so slightly with a bit of weathering powder. Now, I've noticed when I've seen steam specials go past, uh, and I've looked down upon it from the bridge, how quickly a clean engine, get uh, the top of the boiler gets covered in soot. So I'm going to start with a little bit of black weathering powder. I'm using a mixture of uh, cars, weathering powders and uh, AK Interactive weathering powders uh, amongst others that I've accumulated into my collection but this is uh, coal dust and soot so I'm just brushing a little bit onto the top getting some onto the model and then it's a case of rubbing it in a little oh, there we go And an old paintbrush does this rather nicely. And the thing with this, if you put too much on, it'll wash off very easily and you get back to where you were before. You just work it in with the brush. <coughs> just work it down a little bit so you haven't got a hard line. It just sort of blends in. There we go. and blow off the excess. Okay, I'm going to use uh, some brown powders now on the underframe of the tender. Um, there are a number of different brown shades available. I'm going to be using some of the cars uh, and possibly some of the AK range as well. You can have fun mixing and blending in different colours and so long as you take a gentle approach, a little bit and review. Don't put too much on in one go. Okay. We're now going to put some varnish on this, on the A23. More often than not, uh, if, I, if I've painted something, I always paint in gloss, uh, and then I use a varnish to take the gloss down to more of a satin or possibly a matte. If I'm going for a matte finish, I will use uh, a different product. I would use Tester's Dull Coat, spray through the airbrush. Uh, uh, my normal varnish to take something from gloss down to a satin is Ron Seals clear varnish with a bit of gloss with a little bit of matting agent just to take it down and I'm actually going to use that on this just to bring the level up ever so slightly. What I'm doing I'm measuring out some of the varnish. Uh, I ought to point out that this is not the water soluble varnish. Uh, I need to thin this with white spirit. Uh, it is still available. I think I had to go online to get this one though. Okay, so the mix I normally use is about half a spoon of varnish. Okay. Uh, 
that into there and then the matting agent about three drops okay I'm going to drop that onto the spoon quite thick so one two three now when I apply this it's not like paint I'm putting it on from a greater distance and I'm gently misting it on if I'm painting you let the paint build up on the model so you can see a, 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 you can see the finish start to build up with this it's a case of mist it on a bit at a time and see what it looks like. I really don't want to flood this on. Okay, I'm going to thin this so it's approximately one part thinner, one part varnish. So that's about the amount of varnish we put in there. Okay. And ready to spray. Okay, just testing the airbrush to make sure the varnish is flowing okay and I can see the paint misting. And then on with the model. Okay, so I gave it a very light waft over, as you saw. Uh, then paused for a couple of minutes and then gave it another very light waft over. We've just lifted the flatness up ever so slightly. And so that will go into the airing cupboard tonight, or otherwise known as my drying room. And we'll be ready for weathering tomorrow. I hope you found what you've seen there useful. If you did, you can find more information in this book published by Crowwood Press. Now that Jeff Haynes has completed everything that he's done, the weathering, it's time to add the final details, including a crew. Now, no locomotives on the road ever ran without a crew, so I consider this essential. These two little figures are from Millhome Models, little castings which I've just painted and fixed to a little metal base painted matte black. The painting doesn't have to be perfect particularly on locomotives with large commodious cabs and one thing to note, one tangential thing to note is here we've lost this cab side door they're very, very fragile. I think it's wonderful that the likes of Hornby fit them, but somewhere in all the procedures that's gone walkabout, so I'll have to make another and fix it. They are just a little bit on the fragile side. How do we fit the crew? Simple super glue. A little blob on the base. This fireman is a bit lazy but never mind he's just leaning on his shovel and we pop him in there and we'll do the same with the driver. Both installed now Remember, these large LNER Pacifics, the later ones, and in fact every one in BR days, or towards the early 50s, was left-hand drive. So the driver is on the left-hand side. Now, we're modelling steam outline locomotives, and in the main, they ran on coal. 
there were a few that were fired by fuel oil and some were fire less but certainly all the A23s and the A22s ran on coal. What you get in most RTR, in fact all RTR tenders, is moulded coal but I think we can improve on that because nothing looks like coal, looks more like coal than real coal. In order to hold the coal I'm using cheap PVA wood glue. I think this came from a pound store. It's certainly not worth using the very best Evo stick PVA. So we just dribble some on top of the moulded coal. You don't need too much. The beauty of PVA, of course, is that it was easily and very rapidly wiped off with a damp cloth. If I'd have used impact adhesive or super glue, the effect on the side would be ruinous. Spread the PVA around using a cocktail stick. Into all the little nooks and crannies. And this is real coal, popped into a polythene bag, a lump, and then cracked with a hammer until it ends up as smaller pieces. And all one does is just sprinkle it in. And there we are. That will set and look far more realistic. Another thing I insist upon with my locos is that they carry the appropriate lamps. And in fact, I'm often described quite rightly as a zealot with regard to this. The lamps I'm using are Lanarkshire Model Railway Supplies, LMS, Lanarkshire Model Supplies. They're cast metal and they don't really need painting. And they're held in place by tiny little beads of black tack, not blue tack, although it's made by the same firm Bostic, black tack. It's even more tacky and because it's black, if a little bit oozes out, it doesn't matter. I've applied a tiny bead of the black tack to the base of the lamp, and now all I need to do is just stick it in position in front of the lamp iron. Express passenger for the A23 and express fully fitted freight for the A22. Time was when one drilled holes in the bases of lamps to fit over the lamp brackets, but that with white metal is really a bit of a fag. Blacktack is by far a superior method. That concludes the work that I've done on these locos and the work that Jeff Haynes has done. I'd like to thank Jeff in particular for weathering and varnishing these locos respectively. It really has brought them to life. I'd also like to thank most gratefully Simon Kohler for making or being responsible for these rather nice models being made and also for donating them for this project. Anyway, that's really enough from me. I think you can see they've turned out very, very nicely indeed. What we'll finish with are these locomotives belting round little by them. The A23 on an express passenger and the A22 on an express freight. Honeyway 
is going to Scotland. It will become the property of a friend. I'm not quite sure what to do with Earl Marshall. I might even keep it. Anyway, thank you for watching.